In the middle of high school, I moved from Southern California to Texas. Now, there are a lot of great things in Texas. A middle of high school move can be a challenge, but the Lord was kind. I made new friends, got involved in some wonderful activities, got invited pretty early on to a capture the flag game on a large piece of property. Uh, there was an open field and, and there were trees around the edges and, and the goal was to escape and evade the bad guys, to infiltrate enemy territory, grab that flag and run it over to your side of the field. It involved wearing camouflage and hiding out in the dark. And, and I was running away from the bad guys and I decided to find a place to hunker down. I was looking for a, a comfortable hideout and uh, there was a lot of hard ground. There were brambles and briars and, and what looked like scary plants that might cause problems, poison ivy and things. And I felt very fortunate to have found a soft ridge of dirt. And I buried myself in this dirt. It was a comfortable spot to hide out. And if you know anything about Texas, you can probably predict what this soft earthen mound was. Fire ants. And if you've ever seen a fire ant, you recognize you, they're hard to see. They're, they're actually very small. An individual fire ant is hard to find, but if you stir up a mound, you see a, a giant moving blob of red-brown. And fire ants have sharp, powerful mandibles. But their bite is not painful. They use these powerful mandibles to latch on to skin, and then they spit. And the acidic venom is what causes the pain. It creates a, a burning red welt, and this acidic venom gets down into the skin, and, and you look like the worst acne victim ever when this mound turns into a volcanic eruption of oily, itchy pus that then spreads over the rest of your skin. And what follows is weeks of misery. And I had buried myself in this soft mound looking for comfort. <laughs> what I found instead was weeks of tremendous discomfort. We're coming to a letter from Jesus to a church in the first century. A church that had grown comfortable with something that was actually very dangerous. We're reading the letter from Jesus to the church at Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2. This is our series of study of the seven letters from Christ to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And we come now to the third letter, the third church. This is the church at Pergamum. I've entitled this message, Comfortable with Compromise. Let's read together verses 12 to 17 of Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on it, which no one knows but he who receives it. This letter follows the same pattern as the other six letters, and so our outline is the same. There is a salutation, a commendation, a confrontation, a command, a plea, and a promise. That's our outline for the morning. We begin with a salutation. That's the greeting. This is from Jesus to the church at Pergamum. 
the church at Pergamum. And, and we'll have the slides up here again so we orient ourselves geographically. You know that John was on that little island, the rock in the sea called Patmos, the Alcatraz of the first century. He was imprisoned because he testified of Christ. And that's the little red dot so far away from Jerusalem. And, and the red circle there encapsulates the Roman province of Asia Minor. You see there it's between Europe above, what we think of as Asia up to the north, to the right, to the east, and then Africa to the south, the Middle East kind of right there in the middle. And so John is just off the coast of the places he had pastored. He had cared for people and now he was separated from them by being imprisoned. And Jesus cares for his churches through the Apostle John writing these letters. And, and this letter comes from Jesus through John to the angel to the church, to the church at Pergamum. The church at Pergamum is 55 miles north of Smyrna. It is set on a large pile of brown granite. It, it's set about a thousand feet above the surrounding plain. It was said to have a stern appearance of foreboding inhospitableness. A, a, a giant brown imposing rock. It was off the trade routes, and so it wasn't a particularly wealthy city by trade, but it was the center of religion in Asia. And the religion took on two flavors. The first was pagan idolatry. There was a temple to Zeus. There was a temple to Dionysius or Bacchus. You know, the, the god Dionysius was the bull god of alcohol, partying, and drunkenness, revelry. And there was a temple to Athena or Minerva. She was the goddess of wisdom and strategy and intelligence and learning. And then there was a temple to Asclepios. Asclepios was the snake god, the serpent god of medicine and healing. And people came from all over the world to Pergamum for the worship of Asclepios. Even our medical symbols today have a picture of a staff and a snake, sometimes two snakes and wings. All of that comes originally from the worship of the Greek god Asclepios. So the, the one side of the religious flavor of the city was the pagan idolatry. You go to these temples, you have parties there, you engage in sexual immorality as part of the worship of these gods, and then you're accepted into the trade guilds. You can work, you can be part of the union, you, you can earn an income because you paid your dues to these pagan festivals. The other side of the worship in the town, the other part of the religion was the emperor worship. Pergamum had the first temple dedicated to emperor worship in all of Asia. It was dedicated to Caesar Augustus in 29 BC. The emperor in Pergamum was called Theos and Soter, God and Savior. There is literature found at Pergamum that called the emperor Nero the Savior of the world and Lord of the whole universe. Those are blasphemous titles. They, they grate on the ears of the Christian. Those are titles that belong only to the one true God. Titles that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were used openly of the emperor of Rome. In other cities throughout the empire, Christians were in danger. But in Pergamum, where the emperor was associated with Asclepios, who was the god of Pergamum, the serpent god... When, when Domitian was emperor of Rome, the same time of the writing of this letter, he demanded to be called Lord and God. The Christians at Pergamum were in danger. Throughout the Roman Empire, Domitian demanded worship, and, and Christians had to go once a year to burn incense to the emperor. Christians were in danger seasonally. But in Pergamum, they were in danger every day. This was the center point of emperor worship in Asia. And notice how Jesus introduces himself to this church. The one who has the sharp two-edged sword, verse 12. This takes us back to chapter 1 and verse 16. We read there of the glorified Christ. In his right hand he held the seven stars. Out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. John saw him and fell down as a dead man. John the Apostle who was an intimate friend of Jesus during his earthly ministry, sees Jesus glorified and falls on his face as dead. And Jesus is there described as the one who has the two-edged sword, the, the broad Thracian sword, 
meant for fierce battle coming out of his mouth. This is a picture, of course, of Jesus' power to destroy his enemies. We'll we'll see Jesus return in Revelation 19 to the earth and lay waste to his enemies by the sword that comes from his mouth. And, And here, that is how Jesus addresses his followers in the church at Pergamum, in blazing glory, the one who walks among the lampstands, that is, he, he is present amongst his churches, he knows what's going on, he sees what's going on, his eyes pierce with that fiery gaze. We find out that the one who is gravely concerned with the purity of his church has some things to say to the church at Pergamum. And first he gives a commendation. This is verse 13, the commendation. I know where you dwell, Jesus says, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast my name. You did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. There's Jesus' commendation of the church, and it begins with the familiar refrain, I know. Lest we ever think that church is just some organizational thing that humans do down here, minding our own business we are reminded that Jesus knows every detail. He he knows what goes on in his churches. He knows every human heart. He knows every stray thought. And he's concerned. He, He cares. He is a good shepherd. And he gives attention to his churches. Like Psalm 139, God's omniscience here is both a comfort and a threat. Where can I go from your spirit? The psalmist cried. Where can I hide from your presence? Well, nowhere. God is everywhere. God sees everything. He knows everything. And and to those who are allied to him by faith, that is a tremendous comfort. God, nobody can steal me away somewhere where you're not there. John, alone in solitary confinement on the Isle of Patmos, was not alone. And churches under persecution, not alone. It's interesting that Jesus says, I know where you dwell. And when we hear that sentence, I know where you live, it sounds like a threat. (laughs) Here it is a comfort. Jesus knows their situation. Jesus has omniscient situational awareness. He knows what they are enduring. He knows what they are suffering. He knows their environment. And notice what Jesus says about it. Where do they live? Where do they make their habitation? Where have they settled? Where had the gospel taken up residence? In the heart of Satan's dominion. Right in the capital, where Satan's throne is. A throne room is that which holds the seat of authority. It's the center of operations, the center of commands. The gospel had taken up residence in the heart of the evil empire. Now, to what is Jesus referring here when he, when he says, I know where you live? where Satan dwells. Well, it's interesting. We live in Tempe. It's the home of the Arizona State University Sun Devils. I know where you live, Jesus says. At the devil's school, right? Jesus is here making a reference to something familiar to the people at Pergamum. And, And there's a number of ways that I think they would have heard this. You see, Pergamum, as the center of pagan religions, it was definitely the worst of the seven cities for idolatrous worship. It was filled with satanic idolatry and immorality. And then the Acropolis on which the city was built resembled a great throne. When you went to Pergamum on the way up from Smyrna, on that circular road in Asia Minor, you would approach the city and the citadel, this great big mound of brown granite standing out from the plain, looked like a throne. That would be familiar to them. In fact, in the city, in the altar, to, in the temple of Zeus, was an altar shaped like a throne, and Zeus was given the name Soter or Savior. And Zeus's image was represented by sculptures of snakes. And then there was the Asclepius cult. Uh, the Asclepius was the serpent god, and we, we still have those pictures of snakes on uh, emergency service vehicles. An ambulance drives by, there's a pole with a snake on it. <laughs> What is that? That's a reference to Asclepios, the, the evil god in the Greek pantheon of, of healing and, and medicine. There were shrines to this serpent god throughout the Roman Empire, but Asclepios was specifically called the god of Pergamum, represented by a snake. 
And this was the center of emperor worship. It was the strongest here. And so Christians faced the threat of execution if they did not bow the knee and they did not say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar claimed to be Lord and God and Savior of the world. All of these things are satanic imitations of Christ. And we know that all false teaching ultimately comes from Satan. The animosity towards Christians ultimately comes from Satan. All of these things would flavor this statement, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. That's where you live. You're in the heart of it. You are downtown Satanville. And Jesus says, and you hold fast my name. To hold fast is literally to grip tightly with the hands. As a metaphor, it means to adhere strongly to something. And what are the believers holding on to tightly? The name of the Lord Jesus. His identity. His lordship. There is no other God. There is no other Lord but Jesus. There is no other Savior. He is our King. They held fast to that. Not Caesar is Lord, not Nero, not Emperor Domitian, not the gods of Asclepius or Zeus, but Jesus and Him alone. This is a costly fidelity. And notice it is in the present tense. You hold fast my name. You, 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 you do it. You, you go on gripping tightly fidelity to Jesus. I know that you're standing firm on the truth. This is a commendation. And Jesus goes on and says, you did not deny my faith. Verse 13, even in the days of Antipas. The writer to Hebrews talks to the Hebrew Christians being persecuted in Jerusalem and says, you haven't, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding your own blood yet. But the believers at Pergamum had shed blood in their fidelity to Christ. Antipas is the first martyr at Pergamum, and probably a test case, probably one pulled out from the church by the authorities, the authorities thinking, look, if we kill this guy and we make him an example, then this following Jesus stuff is going to stop. And we've said this before, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. For those who are truly born again by God, who fear God, who kills the soul rather than fear man who can only kill the body. What do I need this body for? What do I need temporal comfort for? What do I need riches for? What do I need the next luxury item? What do I need temporal relationships? If I have my sins forgiven and I have Christ, I have everything. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, His kingdom is forever. That's where they stood. Antipas is called Christ's faithful witness. Tradition tells us that he was roasted alive inside a brass bowl superheated by a fire under Domitian persecution. That brass bowl was a representation of Dionysius, the alcohol god. The word for witness here is the Greek word martyr. You know that word in the English language. Uh, it, it meant somebody who just gave testimony of something. It is quite possible that this use of martyr is the first technical use of that word where somebody's testimony about Jesus resulted in their execution. And, and from then on, we use the word martyr to describe those who died for their faith, who died for the cause of Christ. And Jesus says, I know you. you, you stand firm. Even after Antipas was martyred, I don't care if it costs me my life, I will not deny Jesus. And then the verse closes with the little phrase, where Satan dwells. Jesus acknowledges it twice. Your life is hard, Pergamites. I know what's going on there. I, I know how hard it is to hold fast. I know the pressures you're under to, to compromise the truth. And they wouldn't do it. What's interesting here is a reminder of the faithfulness of Antipas will lead to a stinging rebuke to those who would compromise in a different way. And that leads us to the confrontation. If you think about a financial audit, 
This is sort of the scary part of the audit. Here's where you're in trouble. Personal letter from Jesus to the church, and Jesus says, I have a few things against you. And you go weak at the knees and you tremble. What's coming? Here's Jesus' confrontation. Verse 14. You have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam. Here's Jesus' letter to the church. I know where you live, I know how you stand, I know what you suffer, but I also know what you tolerate. And the indictment here is you have become comfortable with moral compromise. Jesus says you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam. And you have to go back to the Old Testament book of Numbers to figure out what this Balaam thing is all about. Balaam was a prophet, he was a pagan prophet, and yet God hired him to speak truth. Meanwhile, Balak, a pagan king, hired Balaam to curse Israel. Israel had been wandering around in the desert for 40 years after they had been rescued from Egyptian slavery and were being taken by God into the promised land. And they had to go by the land of Moab just on the other side of the Jordan River from the Promised Land. They're just about to enter. A generation nearly has died off, and the next generation is about to go and inherit the Promised Land. Moab, the nation, didn't like Israel, some couple million people, getting close. It was threatening. It felt scary. Who are these people? What are they here to do? And so Balak, the king of Moab, gets this prophet Balaam to curse Israel. And and so Balaam goes to Yahweh, the one true God, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, the, the God who rescued Israel out of Egyptian slavery, brought them miraculously through the Jordan River, sustained them in the wilderness for 40 years, gave them food and never let their clothes wear out, and was bringing them into the land and defeated everyone before them. God was on their side. Hey, Balaam, I'll pay you anything you want if you go pray to Yahweh to curse those people. It's probably a reasonable business decision. Empty the treasury so that these people don't overrun us. What should Balak have done? I need to worship the God of Israel. No, he wanted to maintain his own life. Didn't want interference from the God of Israel. Wanted Israel wiped out. Would pay anything to get it. You can read this in Numbers 22 to 24. Yahweh would not let Balaam curse Israel. And you remember one of the scenes in that episode was the angel of Yahweh. And, and in our study, who have we discovered is the angel of Yahweh. That is the pre-incarnate Jesus Before he came to Bethlehem as a baby, before he came and died on a cross, and before he went back to his father, and before he establishes his kingdom, he was ushering Israel into the land, clearing the way, eliminating enemies, and this angel of Yahweh shows up in front of Balaam, in front of Balaam's donkey that he was riding, and stops him cold. You remember Balaam is saying, hey, uh, Keep going, please. Balaam couldn't see the angel of Yahweh. The donkey could. Balaam's beating the donkey. And eventually, the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and the donkey said, I've been your faithful servant all these years. Why are you beating me up? I can't go anywhere. There's this mighty warrior with a sword in front of me. And then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes to see the pre-incarnate Christ as an adversary in his way. And what was God doing there? You're not going to curse my people. I have paved the way for them. I am taking them into the land. I am keeping my promises to them. (laughs) And no Moab, no Balak, no amount of money can purchase escape from my plans. That's God's message. He's getting them into the land just as he promised. So Balaam can't curse him. In fact, he goes back to the king and says, "Uh, man, I tried to curse him. 
but I could only say what Yahweh told me, and now they're blessed. You what? So there's a plan B. Because we don't need to think that Balaam is a good guy. You know, it sounds like a good thing. Well, I can only say what Yahweh says. Man, is he a preacher of the gospel? No, he's a bad guy. But here's the thing. Bad guys are on a short leash. They only get to do what God allows them to do according to his purposes. God is king. God is sovereign. And and let the worst of the worst do whatever they want to do. God will make them do what he wants. So God's accomplishing his purposes. Balaam is still being evil. Balaam's going to be judged for his evil. And he comes up with plan B. You can turn to it if you like, or just mark it in your notes. Numbers 25, 1 and 2, give us Balaam's plan B. While Israel remained in Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and Yahweh was angry against Israel. It results in judgment and slaughter. It's an awful scene. It turned in Numbers 31. In Numbers 25, it just kind of sounds like that's what happened, but we get a behind-the-scenes narration in Numbers 31, 16. Moses said to the commanders when they actually went to unleash God's judgment against these people, he says to them, have you spared the women? Listen, the, the women that came out and seduced Israel unto immorality and brought this plague, you, you're, you're going to let them go? What a, Are you attracted to them still? This was the sin that decimated the nation and and, and you still have an eye for it. Verse 16, Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against Yahweh in the matter of Peor. So the plague was amongst the congregation. In other words, Balaam convinced Balak, Hey, I can't curse him. I got a workaround. Let's tempt him. I can't get God to renege on his promises, but what if I get Israel to renege on their faithfulness? Let's seduce them with parties, feasts, drunken revelry, immorality. Throw some women at them. And Israel fell for it. Maybe the thought is if Israel is unfaithful, God will back down from his promises. And the reality is God judged the individuals involved and still kept his promise to the nation. And think about Israel's susceptibility in those moments. Forty years of wilderness wandering. You're bored with manna, right? That was the the heavenly bread that came down every day as an unbelievable provision. Every day God provided food for them. It was white and sweet and I don't know, I've never had any. But 40 years of the same thing, they they complained. And then they complained against God about the meat that he miraculously and graciously provided. And then along comes this Moabite, Midianite party. Delectables, food. Man, we haven't ever seen food like this. And our fathers haven't seen food like this since Egypt. All spread out. Look at all these people having fun. We can eat with them. We can drink with them. We can revel with them. And, and then the seduction unto immorality. And all of that led to a sensuous feast in the wilderness and pagan idolatry and immorality. In Numbers 31, Yahweh had all the Midianite towns destroyed. Even then, the soldiers tried to keep alive some of the seductive women. And the lesson in all of that is don't dance with those destined for destruction. Don't dance with those who are destined for destruction. Would we be seduced by the sin for which these people are destroyed? And we know this. Sin is illogical. Sin is evil. Sin itself is deceptive. We fall for it. Look at Revelation 2.15. 
Here's what Jesus says after reminding them about the Balaam story. So you also have some in the same way who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. Who were those guys? They, they were followers of the Gentile proselyte to Judaism who showed up in Acts 6 as a servant of the church. Remember, he was one of the ones picked as a faithful guy to serve tables. And he apostatized. He walked away from Christ. Although he walked away from Christ in an interesting way, he, he always claimed to be a Christian. But he said, you know what? You can be a Christian and participate in Ephesian sexual immorality like the Ephesians do in their religious services. They go to their temples. They go to the temple of Artemis or Diana and it involves cult prostitution. And you know what? You can follow Jesus and practice immorality. A different label, um, but the same sin. He had lapsed into what we would call antinomian license. Following Jesus means a freedom from all rules. Nobody tells me what to do. Early church writers said that he picked up on the very thing Paul was speaking against in Romans 6 1, where Paul says, Hey, Grace has come in and is greater than our sin. What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace will increase? And Paul says, by no means. May it never be. No way. But the Nicolaitan said, yeah. Let's sin more and get more grace. This broke out at Ephesus. You remember the letter we read to the church at Ephesus. Jesus commended the Ephesian church for hating the Nicolaitans. And then Jesus says, which I also hate. Good job, Ephesus. You hated the Nicolaitans. Bad job, Pergamum. You have some in your church who hold to that teaching. Jesus hates that teaching. The church at Pergamum didn't consider it a threat. And here, worldliness and pagan immorality was used to turn people's hearts away from the Lord. Even people who had stayed faithful under threat of death. They were loyal to the name of Christ. But some were not loyal to Christ from the heart in their behavior. They wouldn't compromise on doctrine, but they were got with immorality. And the real problem at Pergamum was that Christians let other Christians fall prey to it. Okay, so you don't worship the emperor. You don't go to the altar of Zeus. You don't pay the dues at the Asclepios cult. You don't worship Dionysius. But you will follow Nicholas into immorality, eating food sacrificed to idols, drunkenness, all under the banner of Jesus. Listen, what is the good news of the gospel? Jesus came and died in the place of sinners to forgive sin and give us this entrance into grace in which we now stand. And the grace of God has come teaching us to deny ungodliness. It is a rescue. To follow Jesus is a rescue from having to pay for our sins. It is also a rescue from the power of sin over the life of a believer. Slavery to sin. And, and one day, finally, it is the... Ultimate rescue from the very presence of sin. There's a day coming, Christian, when you will be in Christ's glorious presence and you will be unable ever to sin again. But there's a total rescue package involved. Believing in Jesus is not just a get out of hell free card. Hey, you, you prayed that prayer, you, you, you believed in Jesus that one day and, and now um, go about your business and you won't go to hell. Well, of course it's a rescue from hell. But it is not business as usual. It's a new creation. It's a new life. It is new power. It is a new kind of freedom in Jesus. Well, that was not the message of Nicholas. In fact, Jesus here connects Nicolaitan teaching with the story of Balaam for a very important reason. It's intended to shock the church at Pergamum into sobriety. And listen, we need this. Anytime there's some new teaching that comes into the church, some Christian comes out and writes a new book and it makes a bestseller list and everybody starts reading it and it sort of flashes through, some new wind of doctrine blows through town and everybody goes, oh no, sounds good. But we fall for it. 
And because it sounds new and fresh and exciting and invigorating and people go, man, this is the greatest thing ever. It's, it's, it's changing my life. And people don't just stop and wait and examine. Is it true? Does it square up with the Bible? And what Jesus does here is very important. He attaches Nicolaitan fresh wind doctrine to old error. Listen, there's nothing new under the sun. People have been what people are for about 6,000 years. Same disease, same infection, same culprits. We might find new fangled ways to express it and spread it, but the disease is the same. The makeup of man is the same. We haven't changed and so it's very commonplace to, to have some fresh new teaching. Somebody stands up and says, I follow Christ, and here's this really cool new way to think about things. And you turn back the pages of church history and you go, yep, seen that before. That's what Jesus does here. And it's so helpful because when something new comes into town, we, we don't see where it's headed. Because people we know, people that we love are buying into it and they're still with us and they're singing its praises. So maybe it's okay. Nobody's dying. Nobody's really being harmed. I can't see the consequences of it. Maybe it's not worth getting all worked up about. Can't we all just get along? And there's danger. Jesus says, remember Balaam? Nicolaitans. He, he puts an equal sign there. This doesn't end well. Nicolaitan teaching equals Balaamite seduction. Same lie, new label. We might say something like this, the, the, the free grace movement in our day equals the Keswick deception from a century and a half ago. Same lie, new label. Connecting a current situation in the church to an ancient disaster was intended by Jesus to shock believers into realizing that a group of people in the church was actually compromising with a false teaching that was a mortal danger to them all. And in the Lord's providence, our scripture reading, we're just making our way through 2 Peter. Eric read it earlier in our service. Our scripture reading came from this passage. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Speaking of false teachers doing this very thing. Like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They counted a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, they are accursed children, forsaking the right way, they've gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. These false teachers are springs without water. Do you get the picture? What good is a fresh spring that doesn't produce water? It's worthless. It's mist driven by a storm. That is a, a thirsty agricultural land that needs rain for the survival of the people. Here comes a cloud. It's got nothing in it. It's a deception of no value. And for them, the black darkness has been reserved. They speak arrogant words of vanity. They entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality. They promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. What a tragedy that people would come into the church and say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. And ah, that's so legalistic for you to follow God's directions in the Bible. <laughs> I got a freeway. I got a way you can live where you can have your cake and eat it too. You, you can have your sins forgiven in Jesus and you can live like the world. That's their message. And Jesus hates that message because it's a threat to his precious church. Notice he says there are some there who hold the teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. It's the same word as in verse 13, you hold my name. That is you have a, a white knuckle grip on it. You held fast my name, but some at Pergamum are holding fast to this teaching that endorses immorality. 
And the indictment of the church at Pergamum is not that they taught Balaamite doctrine. It's not that they preached Nicolaitan sermons. Balaam was not in the pulpit. Nicholas was not teaching equipping hour. The problem with the church is that they tolerated those who believed and practiced Nicolaitan Balaamite doctrine. In our day, tolerance is a, a virtue. Not so. To, to tolerate that which is harmful to God's people is no virtue. It's a fundamental lack of love, fundamental lack of fidelity to Christ. And notice verse 15, you have them, church. You possess them. You, you tolerate them. They're, they're there. You allow them to remain in an unbroken practice of sexual immorality. The church at Pergamum had become comfortable with compromise. This was the church of toleration with no backbone. They wouldn't bow the knee to Caesar. They were brave that way. But they allowed some in their midst to bow the knee to sexual temptation. Do you understand this phenomenon? There's a hostile world around us and naming Christ causes us to hunker down. Yeah, rah, 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 we all love Christ. But, but when my brother or sister in the Lord is going down a spiral staircase into the depths of sin, I, all of a sudden I get scared to have a hard conversation with him. Oh, I'll stand up to Caesar. Put me in jail. But will I have the courage to go to my brother? That's hard. By the way, there, there's something you need to know about Satan here. Satan does not possess the virtue of jealousy. Do you know what I mean by that? Our God is a jealous God. It means he's the only one to be worshipped. Now for any of us, that would be totally selfish. I want the whole universe to revolve around me. But for God, it's absolutely right because he is the greatest of all goods and infinitely beautiful and glorious. He is good and he does good. And for any creature to set their affection and attention and worship on a lesser thing would be idolatry, blasphemous toward God and terrible for us. It's right for God to get all glory. He is infinitely glorious. And it is right for God to be jealous. Why? The way a husband ought to be jealous for his wife's affections. The way a wife ought to be jealous for her husband's heart and eyes. This belongs to us. That's appropriate with God. That's a virtue. Satan doesn't have that virtue. Satan doesn't care if you worship at the church of Satan, read an upside down Bible, and tattoo 666 on your forehead. Or if you go to church every week and say prayers and don't mean it from the heart. You're a goody two shoes legalist. Satan doesn't care. He doesn't care if you name Jesus or Anton LaVey. He doesn't care if you're a Hindu worshiping 300,000 gods. Or a new age mystic worshiping the vortex. He doesn't care. It's why in the book of Revelation, you have the Antichrist being worshipped and the Antichrist's right-hand helper being worshipped and the image of the Antichrist being worshipped. Satan doesn't care if he gets all of the worship. He just wants you to not worship the one true God. That's why there's all the religions in the world. There's a command in verse 16. Therefore, repent, Jesus says. You've given in to what Antipas died resisting. That martyr's faithfulness is set in contrast to your compromise. You need a 180 degree turn, an about face. And what would repentance for the church look like? Individuals break the pattern of sexual immorality, pagan feasts, and drunkenness. And for the church corporately to cease being comfortable with compromise. To actually follow God's instructions. Galatians 6.1, you who are spiritual, restore one who is caught in some sin. Matthew 18, the process of, of loving each other and, and having blind spots covered we look out for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. I, I get an encroachment of a hard heart inside me. I need you to help me see it. I don't want to be lost to the deception of sin, to walk away from Christ as a result of a hard heart. I need you to help me keep short accounts with God. Oh, 
I don't want to walk away from Jesus. And I could. I have it in me to throw everything away and miss eternity. Jesus says, repent, or else I am coming to you quickly. This is not the final return of Christ, but just like the letter at Ephesus, a visitation of judgment. Judgment begins with the household of faith before it will be poured out on the world. Jesus says, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Back to Revelation 1.16 in that scene, Jesus, the one who will descend personally, physically, visibly to the earth in Revelation 19 to settle scores with earth dwellers, will personally address in judgment those who have succumbed to unrepentant immorality in the church. He will make war with the sword of his mouth. I believe this is a word of judgment rather than the military weapon we see at the end of the age. This is the authority of Christ's spoken word, the authority of Christ's presence. It's interesting that Jesus says, I will be there, I will come, I will be present. I think this is a reflection of Jesus' promise in Matthew 18. Do you remember what he says after he describes the four-step process of restoration in the Matthew 18 discipline process? He says, where two or three, a reference to the two or three witnesses, are gathered in my name for this process, I will be with you. Again, that, that's not a promise that you have to have two or three people praying before Jesus shows up in his omnipresence. That is Jesus' special presence in the hard process of helping each other recover from sin and its deceptions. And Jesus promises his presence. That same promise is echoed here in this verse. Notice in verse 15 the pronoun change. So you, church, have some who hold the teaching Verse 16, I am coming to you, church, quickly, and I will make war against them. Do you see that? Jesus doesn't say, I, may, I will make war with the church. He does say, I will make war with them. Jesus will come to the church, and he will make war with the unrepentant, who believe that they can name Jesus as Lord, but live for sensuality. Jesus here is saying, look, church, if you will not take care of this corporately, I will take care of it personally. This is an aspect of Jesus' judgment, love for the church. We have a, a flavor of that in 1 Corinthians 11 when the Corinthian church was mishandling communion, the Lord's table, drinking judgment unto themselves by not judging the body correctly. They, they were selfish. They were drunk at the Lord's table. And Jesus says, some of them are sick and some of them sleep. Sleep is a metaphor used of believers dying in the New Testament. It's never used of unbelievers dying. Jesus says he, he took some Christians home in judgment because they wouldn't repent. The same thing is indicated here. So there's a plea in verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. One way that you know that you belong to Jesus. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Friends, do you hear Jesus' words in this letter? Are you on his frequency? Do you have your ears on? Do you welcome loving confrontation, encouragement, and rebuke? Do you long to break patterns of sin and temptation with confession and repentance, putting off sin and putting on righteousness? Are you being led by the Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body? Romans 8. Listen, if you're just playing church, you just show up, you, you're okay with just an outward appearance of Christianity, but from the heart, you're not resonating with these things. Friends, you're in trouble. <laughs> you need to repent and have Christ personally. There's a promise, verse 17, for all who belong to him, to him who overcomes. Again, that's the word overcomer, the victor, Nike, Nikao. It is the one who is victorious over these things. What's the promise? I will give some of the hidden manna. Manna was that, that white, sweet bread of heaven that God provided to the Israelites during their wandering in the desert wastelands. Do you know the, the, a piece of that manna was held as a memorial in the Ark of the Covenant, the gold box that the Israelites carried around? It was the center of their worship of Yahweh and, and inside the box was the piece of the manna. That was a reminder, hey, God took care of you in the wilderness. Remember that stuff rotted after one day except on the Sabbath it lasted two? But God miraculously preserved in that gold box a piece of it as a leftover reminder God takes care of his people. It was hidden away in the box. 
Here, Jesus promises the hidden manna. Remember, the ark was made after a fashion of something in heaven. Here, an eschatological or end times or heavenly promise is given to believers. Forget the feasting with the pagan idolatrous stuff. I know it looks like fun and it's a big party. It's going to kill you. I have everything you need. Eternal provision for the overcomer. All the feasting, all the delight, the, the unending heavenly party for you. You just hold on to me. And then Jesus says, I will give him a white stone and a new, new name written on the stone which no one knows but the one who has it. Remember the city of Pergamum sat on a big pile of brown granite. White stones were rare. You couldn't get them. They all had to be imported. Anything that was written on or inscribed, any of the architectural pieces that were made of white stone, all of it was brought in from far away. So this number one would be a treasure. There's a number of explanations for what Jesus has in mind here. I'll just run through a few of them. It was the early practice that white and black stones were given to a jury so they could vote for condemnation or acquittal of someone accused of a crime. A white stone was given as a token of admission or membership into the trade guilds. White amulets with a god's name, the, the name of a deity, were given out to those who were loyal to the deity. Gladiators who were discharged, remember gladiators were slaves, uh, imprisoned war criminals, those kinds of things, um, and they had to fight in the arena to the death for entertainment, blood sport. But if a gladiator was good enough, strong enough, won enough battles and caught the eye of the emperor, he could be released from his slavery unto death. And gladiatorial discharge was rewarded uh, with a white stone. A white stones were handed out for initiation into service of the Asclepius cult in Pergamum. And then sometimes white stones were just used as a precious commodity. Uh, I need something to write down a note on. <laughs> it's interesting that Pergamum had the second largest library in the ancient world. And Alexandria, Egypt, the largest library, was jealous of Pergamum because they had 200,000 books. And a book back in those days was a handwritten volume, very expensive. 200,000 volume library in this. And Egypt got jealous and they said, we're not sending you parchment anymore. So at Pergamum, they invented another writing material called vellum. It was animal skins dried and stretched that they could write on. So they were very proud about their writing materials. That was really expensive and hard to get. So here's a white stone, also a rare commodity you can write on. Jesus says, I will give you a white stone with a new name on it. When Jesus names you, he is saying, you're mine you belong to me, and that name is keeping with a new identity. Don't you love the way God renames people? Jacob, cheater, got renamed by God, Israel, he who wrestles with God. Simon got renamed Peter, Rocky. And God's just kind to, to, to give Christians a new identity in keeping with being new creatures. When will you know this name? I think this is an end times promise. I think this is in heaven. There will be a personal new name designation for you from Jesus in keeping with who you are in your individualized personal relationship to him. We have some takeaways to think about. We're going to save those maybe personal applications till the end of this series. And, and we're going to have a Sunday morning sermon where we sort of take all of these letters and personalize them. Not so much about churches, but taking a personal inventory. How is my life before the Lord? Um, so I, I had thoughts of sharing some of those this morning. We'll, we'll hold on that. We'll just sing. But know that that's coming. And, and use your own reading of these letters to self-examine before the Lord. Let the Lord do work through these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your kindness to give personalized messages to these church, churches nearly 2,000 years ago that resonate so clearly with us. We pray that our hearts would be yours totally and fully. I pray that this church would have the courage to stand up to Caesar and say, Jesus is Lord and him alone. And I pray that we would have the endurance 
that you would grant us by your grace internal heart fidelity that would say to sexual immorality, no, Jesus is my Lord. I pray that we would never smuggle under the banner of Christ things that you hate, O Lord. Would you give us an intolerance at our own heart level for that which displeases you? And would you give us an intolerance for allowing those things to fester in each other? Let us love deeply with real, biblical, Christ-like love. It's in your name we pray it. Amen.